Hello and welcome. It's Global Political Economy News Docs. I'm Lynn Fries. As the COVID-19 lockdown poses unprecedented problems for economic policymakers, some countries have more problems than others when it comes to implementing an effective and appropriate government response. The issue being dogmatic taboos and prejudices about debt management and monetary policy can stand in the way. This news doc explores how that applies in Europe, more specifically the European Monetary Union, with its German doctrine that the central bank must under no circumstances finance state budget deficits. Here to talk to us about this is Heiner Flasbeck. A macroeconomist, Heiner Flasbeck is publisher and editor of Flasbeck Economics International. Prior to this, he was director of UNCTAD's Division on Globalization and Development Strategies. From 1998 to 1999, Heiner Flasbeck was state secretary in the German Federal Ministry of Finance. Welcome, Heiner. Thanks for joining us. Welcome for inviting me. Heiner, as the COVID-19 lockdown is a state-imposed standstill on the economy, what's happening now with the shutdown of production is a kind of shock which is different from what we've seen in other crises in the world economy. Let's start there. Comment on uh, how the governments are responding. What the government does is just to buffer the negative income effects of this uh, lockdown. And that's a different thing. But nevertheless, the government needs huge amounts of money because we're talking about something like a loss of 20% or at the end it will be 25% of our overall income of GDP for us domestic product, uh, which is uh, uh, obviously a huge, huge amount of money. And this has at least partly been uh, compensated by government debt. And this government debt has to be financed to a very large part by the central bank because if, if these, uh, in, this increase of government debt would lead to dramatically rising interest rate, that would really then be a big burden. The central banks have to do their job, which is uh, to keep the interest rates low. And they do it uh, in part at least by uh, buying the papers that the government is issuing. So, so giving credit to the government in, in, in an indirect way and a direct way in the United States, it's indirect in the United Kingdom, it's direct in Europe, it's indirect. So, but nevertheless, it's always the financing that comes, majority of the financing comes from uh, central banks. So call it money printing or money creation, however you call it, but definitely, the central banks, by keeping the interest rate low, are, so to say, providing the governments with the money that is needed to uh, cushion at least a little bit the effects of the corona shock. In Europe, there is a lot of controversy about the role of the central bank. Tell us about that. Well, in, in, in Europe, uh, to be concrete, in the European Monetary Union, we have a very peculiar situation indeed, uh, because we have a central bank, but that central bank is not uh, obviously is not obviously uh, the central bank of each and every country. We have created by treaty Maastricht Treaty uh, European Monetary Union, which has dramatic flaws in in the treaty already. Uh, so that the treaty uh, says very clearly uh, any kind of central bank financing for the government for any government is forbidden. This leads to the, to the yeah, curious situation uh, that um, weaker countries, in inverted commas, weaker countries uh, can have difficulties on the capital market to get uh, the means that they need, the money that they need now to fight the crisis, uh, like Italy. And, and this, is, this is a really a stupid arrangement in Europe. It would be very simple to solve the problem in, in the European Monetary Union if, as I said, the central bank would behave as the central bank of each and every country, because then the central bank would do what she does in all countries of the world, more or less. Uh, she would uh, go to the capital market and keep the interest rates low. But keeping Italian interest rates as low as German interest rates is already seen, seen by many in Europe as, um, 
a violation of the treaty. It is urgently needed to, to change this arrangement uh, and uh, to uh, give the, the ECB, the European Central Bank, the freedom to do what is necessary to keep the interest rate, rate of all members low and to uh, fight the capital market. Now the ECB has found a pragmatic, pragmatic way to deal with it. They have a new program, a pandemic uh, program, uh, and um, they said they are much more flexible in this program than ever before. And the markets have clearly interpreted this in a way that they say, oh, uh, be, be careful if you speculate against Italy, uh, the ECB may be, may be uh, so flexible that she would, uh, uh, she would counteract and she would uh, avoid uh, that the Italian uh, interest rates go up so that the spread between Italy and, and Germany rises. So um, there is, um, it's somewhere uh, in the gray zone of uh, legality, but uh, what the ECB does is absolutely reasonable. Uh, the problem is that uh, the politicians, in particular in Germany, do not want to discuss this openly. Now we had even uh, a court, the German, the highest German court ruling that the ECB policy is inadequate to a certain extent, which, which brings in a new danger, a new danger to the whole arrangement so that uh, it is not quite clear how the ECB fends off this uh, accus accusation. The signals that we have now from the from the judges that uh, were behind this uh, ruling. Uh, well, they say, oh, we didn't mean it exactly like this. And so and they are really surprised by the, by the harsh criticism all around the world. They, they were called stupid by many people, not only by me. And they are really, really shocked uh, to a certain extent. And I think the German government will try to arrange something behind the scenes as usual. This is the German way or the European way to deal with things. We do something behind the scenes. So we have a lot of telephone calls and uh, uh, we try to settle without explaining and without uh, attacking the real problem, which is behind that. I think they will find a way and the, the court will not uh, complain because as I said, the court uh, itself is, is shocked by, by it, the reaction to its ruling. In a commentary about this uh, ruling on the European Central Bank by the German Constitutional Court, you wrote that economic logic is not the domain of jury prudence. The upshot being the way you see it, the judges got lost in what you called a complex economic jungle. As a macroeconomist, what do you think is one of the things least understood about macroeconomics? What many people do not understand, unfortunately, is, is the interconnection, the interrelationship between current account uh, balances and the public budget and the, the rest of the saving and uh, debt, debt balances that we have in an economy. The simple uh, thing is that wherever there's a saver, there must be a debtor. You cannot have one, one group of the economy saving without another group uh, being indebted. So the traditional arrangement in the whole world was in the 60s, and 50s, 60s, uh, when we had wonderfully uh, booming economies, the arrangement was private households would be savers, net savers, and the companies would be the net debtors, and the government would keep out and uh, externally not much would happen. So now that has changed dramatically in the last 10, 15 years, now we have uh, companies, uh, well, as a result of the neoliberal uh, revolution, obviously, we have the wonderful world where we do not have this traditional arrangement anymore. Some people say we do not have market economy anymore because what happened, we now have the companies as net savers in most countries, United States and Europe, more or less everywhere, Japan in particular. So, but if the companies are net savers also, we have private households net savers, company net savers, uh, then obviously for the world as a whole, there's only one party that can be a debtor. For the world as a whole, that's the government. There is nothing else. But smaller countries or middle countries like Germany can go for a solution, solution again in inverted commas, which means, oh, the, 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 foreign, the foreigners can be the debtors. Huh? So if you are able to achieve a current account surplus, you're in the wonderful situation that the foreigners are the debtors, and uh, inside the country, all, all the sectors can be savers. So even the government in Germany was a net saver in the last five to six years, which is really a stupid uh, solution because that means 
uh, that other countries are not able to reduce their government deficit. Because if you are a deficit country in Europe, in particular in the monetary union, like France and Italy is, has formerly a surplus, but is a deficit country because it has lost competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Germany. But if you have lost competitiveness and you're not able to go for a current account uh, surplus in a growing economy as Germany did, because Germany prevents you from doing that, then you end up with a situation, if your companies are also net savers, that the government has to go for a deficit, the government has to allow deficit if the government does want to avoid a permanent recession or a permanent standstill or permanent uh, uh, downfall of the, of the overall economy. So that's for logical reasons. Italy could not, Italy could not do what the Germans did. And so here comes now the, uh, the, the, the political uh, dimension of this. Now the Germans say, oh, we are strong. We have done the right thing. The, Italy, uh, the Italians are weak. They have done the wrong thing. And this is stupid if the surplus country that needs definitely the deficit country for doing what it does says, but I'm the good guy and you're the bad guy. Other economists that I've talked to about this myth or prejudice that surplus countries are good and deficit countries are bad explain that at the world level, income equals demand. So at the national level, when a country like Germany runs a surplus, that means their level of demand is below their level of income. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. They're living below their means, as we say. Germany is living below its means. It uh, spends less than it could and should. And uh, that means other countries are lacking demand. So uh, a country like France that has a deficit with Germany is lacking demand from its own savers. It's lacking demand from its own companies and is lacking demand from the, from the foreign trade, in foreign trade. And that means uh, it's overall lacking demand. So who could compensate for that? There's only one group left, logically, and this is the government. So the government has to go uh, and, and, and create demand, so to say, by living beyond its means. The government has to spend money, as some stupid people in, in Germany say, the government spends money that it doesn't have. But that is exactly what is needed. The government has to spend money uh, that it doesn't have because all the others have money but they do not spend and uh, this has to be compensated otherwise the uh, any economy in the world would collapse in a very short time so this is obviously what we have to learn this is uh, macroeconomic logic it call it logic it's bookkeeping more or less uh, but uh, it is unfortunately is not understood by by very many people and it's not understood by the majority of our uh, traditionally trained uh, neoclassical economists. In an op-ed called Corona Politics and the European Challenge, you drew attention to the fact that Germany had a trade surplus with Italy, France, and Spain of 63 billion euros in 2019, and that the volume of trade between these countries was 376 billion euros. Explain the point that you go on to make, that if these three economies collapse for a very long time, Germany will not be able to expect a recovery for a very long time, not to mention the political consequences. I should also note in parenthesis that after Germany, France, Italy, and Spain are the second, third, and fourth largest economies in the European Union. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Germany needs these countries. Germany needs Europe more than any other country because Germany is dependent on exports more than any other, uh, other big country in the world. Uh, the export share in, in the GDP is 50%. This is extraordinary. It's absurd uh, for such a big country to have such a huge export share. A uh, country like Switzerland can have that or others, or Netherlands, but, uh, but for Germany it's really absurd. But it depends. So its whole structure is biased uh, towards exports and uh, if this breaks now in one way or the other, then Germany will be hit by the crisis much more than other countries. And if Italy, France and Spain and others do not get out of this crisis uh, in a reasonable way, then Germany will be hit more than the others. That's no doubt about it. Heiner, the European Stability Mechanism, the program designed about a decade ago as the EU bailout fund at the time of the European sovereign debt crisis, has been widely criticized as not getting at the real problem, but just kicking the can down the road, extend and pretend. But not only for that, also 
for its loan conditionalities, in other words, austerity, which were seen as damaging and brutal. That austerity was justified by blaming the recipient countries for profligacy, like at the time Greece was at the receiving end of the moral hazard argument that weak or bad governments should not be rewarded with cheap credits. In the current corona crisis, no one's blaming Italy or Spain for profligacy. But just the same, a proposal for euro or corona bonds by nine EU member states, including Italy and Spain, was rejected. Germany and the Netherlands rejected the proposal, as you've explained, because they were unwilling to accept shared debt without the power to impose further structural reforms on so-called weaker economy. Well, again, the Europeans have not really learned the lesson of the last 10 years. We should have understood this relationship that I explained between government balances and private balances, but we, many politicians at least do not have, and economists as well, which is a big problem because uh, we, we need exactly this logic uh, to get to get out of uh, out of the trouble in which we are, because uh, uh, as I said before, only if we're able to to spend, only if the government is able to do its job at this moment of time, then there is uh, there's a way uh, out of the crisis. If if we go back to austerity, or as many people start talking now, we got back to a period of 20 years of saving and of restricting. Well, then Europe will be definitely dead in a couple of years uh, because uh, then uh, it's quite clear that the electorate uh, will, not, uh, will not go with these politicians anymore that are ruling us now, but they will go uh, to the right, they will go to nationalist parties, and the nationalist parties will then destroy Europe. This is um, a possibility, and it's getting more probable day by day. This is a quote from your op-ed, Monsieur Macron, the Germans and Europe. Perhaps never before has a French president said so clearly that the way some northern EU nations are currently conducting themselves can very quickly bring about the end of Europe. He warned strongly against populism, the nationalist forces that could gain the upper hand in southern Europe and in his own country. And also that Macron clearly understands the consequences by pointing to a historical error of his own country, which is still not understood and appreciated in Germany of all countries. He says, Macron, that it was a major mistake of the Allies after the First World War to insist on German reparations in the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah, uh, indeed, I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, President Macron, but um, at a certain point, it was two or three weeks ago, he gave an interview to Financial Times where he spoke out very clearly and with a lot of insight that I did not expect to see uh, coming out of him. He said very clearly that Europe cannot continue like this. And then to my big surprise, he really mentioned uh, the problem that uh, uh, had arisen after the First uh, World War where the Allies forced Germany to pay reparations. And one person in the world uh, obviously knew that it would end up in disaster and that uh, person was John Maynard Keynes. And he called this problem the transfer problem. That is the problem that you cannot, you cannot create current account surpluses, which Germany would have needed at that time, if your partners do not allow you to do that, if they, if they insist, that, if they defend their current account surpluses. So and this is uh, indeed a dramatic similarity to the today's situation, because Italy would have to create a current account surplus, but Germany is insisting that it st sits on its current account surplus and fighting anything Italy could do to, to create a current account surplus. So at the same time, the Germans ask Italy to reduce its debt, which is impossible if Italy cannot uh, create a current account surplus. And this is, this is the paradox that was at that time created by the transfer problem, how Keynes called it. And as I said, Keynes was, uh, as much as I know, the only person in the whole world who understood this uh, macroeconomic logic. But it's exactly the logic I've been talking about before. Uh, when I talked about the fiscal balances inside an economy and uh, the, the surpluses and deficits. Uh, and, and the tragedy is that today, in today's world, nobody in Germany understands the, this, this, this logic anymore. This is the core of the matter in, in Europe. 
And, um, but coming back to, to Macron, let me say one thing that is important now. Uh, yesterday, Macron and Merkel came with a new initiative uh, to spend money in, in Southern Europe and the countries that are the weaker countries again. Uh, but this is exactly the way uh, they always try to solve problems in Europe. Namely, there is a problem now, there's a huge tension between Germany and France after the Macron interview, after this uh, ruling of the German court. Uh, now they come together, they say, they say, oh, we're creating a no, new program. We show that the axis between France and Germany is working, that it's functioning, it's put it, pushing Europe ahead. They're not talking about the real problems of the monetary union. They do not address these problems. They do not uh, tackle these problems, but they, they uh, taper it over by a, a new program. Uh, nobody knows what, what, is, what it will be the outcome, whether it will be done or not. But this is, this is the kind of window dressing that they do all the time in Europe. And this is, this is the big problem and this is the big mistake that the politicians are not open or not able, I don't know, uh, not open and not able uh, to really talk uh, straight about these problems and try to solve these problems. As long as uh, the Eurogroup or the European finance ministers, including the central bank, do not agree on a simple rule that says this central bank is the central bank of each and every country, uh, then, then the uncertainty remains and the countries cannot act as they should to fight these disastrous outcomes of the corona shock. Heiner Flasbeck, thank you. Thank you for having me. And from Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for joining us for this episode of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Docs.